Okay. Thank you so much for staying for the next speaker. Um, we will be listening to uh, Ksenia Turkova, who is a journalist for Voice of America, and uh, she has had over 20 years of experience at Russian and Ukrainian uh, news outlets. She is also a linguist with a doctorate in philology and has been a guest lecturer at multiple U.S. universities and was a professor at Moscow University. Uh, her 2017 book, No Stress Russian, focused on making the language accessible to novice language learners. She is the author of a number of articles about how current events affect speech. Senia Turkova is a member of the expert committee of the Word of the Year contest also. The title of her presentation is War and Propaganda, Russia's Narratives about the Invasion of Ukraine. And I thank her very much for coming and speaking to us. Uh, she came from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for having me. I will uh, start with uh, uh, telling you a couple of words about myself, uh, besides what uh, has been already said. Uh, I guess I am a journalist for Voice of America now, and uh, I uh, moved to the United States in 2017. Uh, from Ukraine. I lived in Kyiv, Ukraine for four and a half years and uh, before I lived in Moscow and I started my career in Moscow where I worked for uh, different uh, news outlets, mostly private, I, uh, actually only private <laughs> news outlets and news TV channels uh, and um, uh, working in Moscow as a TV host as, and as a reporter um, in, uh, for the news, news channels, I was witnessing how the situation with media in Russia was gradually changing uh, and how um, Russia actually came to what, uh, what they have now with all the censorship and repressions against the independent media because it, uh, it didn't happen uh, overnight, it was happening gradually. Uh, and uh, I, I can tell you a lot about that because, because I was witnessing that uh, as a journalist working for private TV channels uh, and actually the first TV channel I worked for, uh, it was the, maybe the most uh, popular and influential news TV channel in, uh, uh, in, at the end of 90s and early 2000s, uh, MTV. Uh, MTV. Uh, and uh, it was very famous TV channel. All journalists in Russia were dreaming to work there. I started there as an intern in 2000, in the year 2000, when Putin came to the power. And uh, in 2001, uh, uh, after only one year of my, my work there, uh, this TV channel was overta overtaken by the state oil company Gazprom. Uh, and after that, we are um, the part of our team uh, started a new channel, uh, uh, TV6, uh, uh, TV6, uh, that was also closed, uh, shut down because of the censorship. And then the next channel we started was also closed <laughs> because of the censorship. So uh, I worked for the number uh, of media uh, that were always like persecuted or shut down or closed, and uh, it was already uh, clear that uh, the situation is not good with with media in Russia, even in, in, in the early uh, in the early 2000s, we, we saw those signs, uh, and I will uh, tell you a little bit about that as well. Uh, and so, in 2013, I moved to Ukraine because I got a, a job offer from uh, Ukraine uh, to create a new uh, radio station, news and talk radio station. Uh, and I moved there with some of my Moscow colleagues. Uh, um, they, uh, they used us as, as experts because they actually didn't have news and talk radio station uh, in Ukraine and they wanted uh, to, to imply that experience uh, in the country. And so we moved there in 2013. Uh, we were thinking we were moving only for one year, but then uh, the revolution of dignity happened, uh, Maidan, uh, and uh, I decided to stay in Ukraine. Uh, we created, we launched this radio station that was very successful. Uh, I, I learned Ukrainian language and I speak fluently. Uh, so I, now I work both in Russian and in Ukraine, in, in Ukrainian for Voice of America. Uh, and uh, then I worked for uh, one of the TV channels in, uh, in Ukraine called Hromatsky TV. Uh, uh, and um, it's a public uh, TV channel uh, and website and multimedia, multimedia uh, media resource. 
uh, and then I got a job offer from Voice America and I moved to the United States. Uh, so I have uh, strong uh, connections, you know, both with Russia and uh, with, U with Ukraine, and I know a lot uh, about uh, both, both countries. And I'm also uh, a philologist. Uh, I, uh, I have PhD in philology, language and literature, and uh, m my uh, field of study is uh, texts of media. Uh, so I study, I research uh, media texts and specifically propaganda and uh, so-called newspeak and political language and yes, how the uh, current events affect uh, our language and our everyday speech and uh, I will talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, so uh, to start with, I want, I actually want to uh, I created this uh, presentation some time ago, but every time I give a lecture about uh, propaganda, I change it uh, a little bit because uh, we have a lot of events, uh, a lot of things going on now, so I, every time I add something relevant and uh, actual into, into this presentation. And I want to start, something happened. <laughs> I wanted to start with something that, uh, with the event that happened yesterday. So I will show you the picture and you will understand what. No, I, I don't think it's a cyber attack from Russia. <laughs> 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 Well, I, I will uh, I, I will tell you first, and then you will see the picture because it's very important to see the picture. Uh, yesterday, a Ukrainian uh, and American photographer Evgeny Maladetka uh, got uh, a, an award, World Press Photo Award, for his uh, picture of a pregnant uh, Ukrainian woman in uh, Mariupol. Uh, you, uh, you probably have seen that picture. Uh, it's a picture of a woman uh, and uh, several men are carrying her out of the maternity hospital and uh, uh, she is uh, unconscious uh, and uh, we can see the building of that hospital uh, bombed. Uh, everything is destroyed around and so he got, uh, he, he actually, it's not his first award, he, he got an award for um, the series of uh, photos from Mariupol. Uh, and yesterday he got uh, the award for that particular picture and I wanted to show that picture to you uh, to start with because uh, it, it has to do, uh, it has something to do with propaganda. Uh, we, um, well, I will, I will tell you the story <laughs> uh, while we are waiting. Uh, because uh, when that happened, that um, shelling of maternity hospital in March of 2022, uh, the main uh, narrative uh, in uh, the Russian media was that it was all staged. Uh, if you have seen those pictures, you, you can understand that it cannot be staged. Uh, uh, I don't know, even, even uh, if Steven Spielberg uh, came to <laughs> Mariupol and staged all that, it, would, it wouldn't be uh, possible. Uh, because uh, it, it was all, all, all destroyed, uh, there were real people uh, killed and wounded and uh, suffering, you can't uh, fake it. Uh, but in Russia, on all state TV channels and in the state media newspapers, they were telling people uh, that uh, it was all staged, that the hospital was not working, uh, they were, there were like military people there, the Ukrainian Nazis, as they called them, uh, and there were no civilians, no women, uh, and uh, they even found one of the, I, I actually have two pictures and I, <laughs> uh, I, I hope I can show them to you. So there was another photo of another pregnant woman uh, going downstairs, you probably have seen that photo, the young girl, uh, also pregnant, and, uh, uh, and uh, we, we see that uh, Mm, the building inside is also uh, partially destroyed and she's going downstairs with some people and so in the Russian media and in, on social media as well they spread it, um, that narrative that, that uh, another girl who was going downstairs she's a beauty blogger uh, they found her Instagram account 
uh, and she she was a she was a beauty blogger in Mariupol. Uh, but uh, based on that fact that she was a beauty blogger, they were saying that um, she uh, did some makeup, uh, and uh, it was that's why it was all staged uh, because she's a beauty blogger. And the, the other woman, uh, unconscious, that I mentioned before. Uh, they were saying that uh, it was the same woman. Like, uh, same woman, just different clothes, different makeup. Uh, although um, we know that uh, the first woman uh, going downstairs, she survived and her child survived, who is a beauty blogger. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the second woman didn't survive and her child didn't survive. So uh, from the beginning, it was known uh, that uh, there were two different people, uh, two different women, but uh, in Russia, they were... And uh, uh, I do remember how we, um, when we were posting news about that uh, on Voice of America, every time we posted something about uh, that bombardment of uh, Mariupol Maternity Hospital, uh, uh, dozens of uh, bots, uh, trolls on <laughs> internet, they came to the comments and were saying the same thing. It was all staged, she's a beauty blogger. It was all staged, she's a beauty blogger. Uh, and, and it was like copy paste of the same, uh, almost of the same text. Uh, and um, throughout uh, the war, uh, we, we have seen that uh, each time that something like that uh, happened, uh, like in Mariupol, or uh, for example when they bombed um, the railway station in Kramatorsk, uh, or um, uh, that um, center mall uh, in Vinitsa, or, and a lot of situations like that, each time they said that uh, it was uh, whether staged or it happened, but there were no civilians. Uh, and uh, from the beginning uh, of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, uh, the Russian state media were, um, ha have, uh, has been uh, creating the whole new reality. Because we can uh, talk about propaganda, uh, and I, I usually uh, hear from people a lot like, oh, there is propaganda in every country. And it is true, yes, there, there is some propaganda in, in, in every country. Uh, but when usually when people say that, they mean that some media are biased. Do we have like biased media in the United States? Ye yes, we do. Some <laughs> we do have biased media. Or uh, people talk about some twisted reality. Uh, but uh, now, um, especially after the war started, we cannot talk anymore about the twisted reality in Russia. We can talk about like the whole different reality. It's an alternative reality. They have a special vocabulary for that, uh, they have special um, special words, coverage, pictures, like they created, they, they have been creating it from scratch, like a different reality. Yes, yeah, oh, thank you so much. So let's uh, look at those pictures. This is the woman who didn't survive, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the photo that uh, Evgeny Malaletka got an award for yesterday. He is a photographer for Associated Press news agency. And this is another woman who is a beauty blogger. And uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, fact-checking materials proving that it was not staged uh, with all the proofs, numbers, and and uh, other things. So uh, it was proved by dozens of uh, independent sources in different countries. Uh, also, when the Bucha uh, massacre happened, uh, they used the same narrative. They said that it was all staged and those bodies were fake. Like they, uh, they went there and they put fake bodies on the road. Uh, and uh, even uh, they spread one video where, as they said, you could see the body moving, like uh, the, the car is passing by and the body is moving behind. But it was not moving because it was, there was also a fact check after that. It was not moving, it was like a mirror reflecting something like, uh, the body was not moving at all. And the, I looked at that video several times and I was trying to slow it down to see 
like any sign of no, there, there's no sign of body moving or anything like that. Uh, but uh, even my uh, friends, uh, for, former friends from Russia, former colleagues, uh, very well educated people, uh, like heads of <laughs> some companies, uh, they, after I posted news from Bucha on my uh, Facebook um, page, uh, they said, uh, don't, uh, don't fall for fakes, don't fall for fake news, don't, don't, don't believe in fakes. So they, uh, well-educated people, they still believed in, in that. Um, so as I said, uh, as I said, we uh, have to say about some kind of creating a new reality. And I will show you the video I made for my YouTube channel about how some of those fakes uh, were being created. Uh, and let me actually, maybe, yes, this is the video. But I can't go from there, right? From here. Try to just move like a mouse and see if you can click on the, on oh. the, on the touchpad. Oh, okay, let's try. See, if it helps, it doesn't. So then we have to get out of the phone, right? Ah, maybe I should go here because it's not right. Okay. I'm sorry, the sound is not very good. Ah, it doesn't go here. So when the world Well, then we need again the, the tech guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, the, I don't know their connections uh, for the sound. Okay. So there was one video, and I think it was right after Bucha happened, uh, they showed on the, one of the Russian state TV channel, the, they showed a video of uh, so-called, they say they uh, claimed they were Ukrainian uh, military, uh, like doing a makeup on some dead body, or a, a fake body, I'm sorry, on some fake body. And they say, you see, uh, they are preparing that body to be uh, put somewhere in Bucha or other uh, cities in Kiev uh, district. Uh, but then, uh, what happened? They showed it on one of the state Russian TV channels. And um, one of the film directors of uh, the Russian series, uh, Russian TV series, she recognized her video. She filmed in one of the Russian cities uh, and it was a fake body, but it was like a criminal series about uh, something, some, uh, some criminal series. And uh, uh, they, were, they uh, made this body specifically for that series. Uh, and they threw it out of the window, so the body uh, fell uh, on the car, or the roof of the car. Then they were doing some makeup and stuff, and she recognized it. And uh, I called her, and I recorded her saying, well, it's my video, I'm going to sue that. Uh, uh, the channel that showed, but it didn't end, end well. She actually had to uh, leave the country, uh, and now she lives in Germany. Not because of that reason, but uh, because of many reasons. Uh, she was also a volunteer, and she was helping uh, Ukrainian refugees to get out of Russia, uh, where they were uh, for forcefully uh, uh, brought. Uh, so that's why she left Russia. And uh, we can go without uh, video. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm waiting, sorry. I'm waiting for the tech person. I don't know what's going on. Maybe at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk, I can show some videos if uh, someone can uh, help us. Because I, I have several uh, videos. Because I think it's very important to see what is really going on on Russian TV. Uh, because I think here uh, a lot of people they don't understand to what extent this propaganda works, uh, and uh, sometimes it's. Uh, to the extent you can even imagine, you can you cannot even imagine. It's to the it's total uh, dehumanization of uh, the whole country, the whole nation, and, uh, and so on. So it's very important to to see those uh, pieces uh, as as videos. Uh, but actually, this one is not. Uh, 
I, I yeah, jumped I think, about it a little bit. So it shows Let the me continue. It yeah. shows the PowerPoint, but not the videos. Ah, okay. Uh, so as I said, uh, Russian state media are creating the alternative reality, like in uh, series Stranger Things, uh, we have upside down, and uh, that that is what is going on in Russia now. Uh, uh, and um, now, uh, before I start talking about the main narratives of Russian uh, propaganda about Ukraine and about Ukrainians and about war and the main tools they use, because as a Philologist, I analyze the words they use in the rhetorical tools. But before, I wanted to mention one book maybe you will be interested in. Uh, there is a famous uh, Russian writer, contemporary writer called uh, Dmitry Golkovsky. Uh, he also had to leave Russia because there was a criminal case against him open and uh, he was uh, persecuted by Russian government because of criticizing the war. Uh, several years ago, I think it was before the pandemic, um, yes, because I was listening to that book during pandemic, he uh, wrote this book called The Outpost. Uh, and actually, it's about uh, it's a book about propaganda. You have you can find it in English. Can, uh, uh, it's about uh, Russia in the future when uh, the civil uh, some kind of civil war happened, and uh, uh, Russia is not uh, that big anymore, uh, divided into several uh, not countries but just uh, some parts of Russia that are fighting with each other, and there's the center in uh, Moscow. Uh, and there is Tsar uh, at that time in his book. And so they created uh, some kind of uh, special prayer. When people hear that prayer, uh, they, became, they become uh, absolutely crazy and they kill each other. Uh, and uh, the only way uh, to avoid this special prayer uh, that makes you, uh, that turns you into an animal, that makes you crazy, is to gouge your ears. So it's the, or the only way to fight uh, this. Otherwise, uh, you will um, become like all other people who heard it. Uh, and I think it's a very, uh, very good uh, um, picture of uh, propaganda uh, and to what extent it developed in Russia now, because you cannot resist it. Uh, it's very difficult for people to resist it because it's everywhere. Uh, independent media are shut down, uh, and uh, some people, uh, for example, in like rural area, or little uh, towns and villages, they don't have anything except uh, one or two TV channels, and uh, they have only this picture. Uh, internet is also like closely, uh, regularly closing, like uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, they are consider, considered extremist resources, uh, and uh, so stuff like that. Uh, and uh, now it's, I, I see it um, by um, talking uh, to my uh, relatives or my friends or my um, uh, former colleagues, I see how uh, that turns people uh, into, um, uh, actually into zombies sometimes because they, they, don't, uh, uh, they, do, they don't even want to understand what is really going on and uh, they believe in everything they hear from uh, state TV. Uh, now we can we can show it. Okay. It's not connected to the screen. Yes. Um. Just a second. Uh, it's okay. I can go on with this, but I will have three more videos at the end. So I think this is a very good metaphor of uh, this is a very good metaphor of uh, propaganda, and if you're interested, you can find this book uh, on internet. And uh, uh, this is a very good picture I like uh, in Russian. It says, uh, "You are uh, lying about everything, but I believe you." Uh, and the person is sitting in front of the in front of the TV screen, and uh, he is like angry at people who are telling him something, but at the same time he is like, yes, you're lying, but I believe you. Uh, and that's how how it works very often. Uh, so as I said, the, the situation uh, was not uh, the situation didn't change uh, or overnight. Uh, oh, sorry, I will skip the slide because it was. <laughs> 
I, I wanted to talk about it a little bit later and it was a wrong slide, I'm sorry. Uh, so I will uh, talk a little bit about how uh, Russia's uh, propaganda statements and narratives about Ukraine uh, has been changing uh, since uh, 2004 uh, when uh, the Orange uh, Revolution, so-called Orange Revolution happened uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, even then, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, they used the same narratives they use now, but uh, now they have more narratives. So that list uh, is growing. Uh, they started from, like, uh, the main narratives were the revolution was uh, backed or even initiated by the US and Western countries. So they, uh, they were trying to tell people in Russia that uh, protest can't be, cannot be inspired by people themselves. So you cannot uh, just uh, go on the street, uh, streets when you don't like something and uh, you want to, to say no to something, uh, to protest. Uh, you might be bribed or you might be inspired by, in a bad way, like by someone. Uh, and uh, they have been using the narratives for, for years, uh, showing that uh, it can be sincere, your protest can, can't be sincere. They use the same narrative actually uh, about uh, the mass protests in Russia in 2011-2012. They, they said the same thing. Uh, and uh, the activists were bribed, the activists were drugged, uh, and now on Russian TV, since the beginning of the war, uh, you could hear, if you, uh, if you watched Russian TV, you could hear almost every day uh, that Zelensky is using drugs. I, I don't know why uh, they using that, uh, that story, that, that narrative, uh, but almost in every news uh, review or program, they say that Zelensky is drugged. Uh, and people who support uh, him, uh, they are like sick or drugged or something like that. Uh, so for some reason they, they use this motive. Mm. Uh, and again, it shows us uh, what it can tell us, that uh, people cannot be sane. If they're protesting, that, uh, th there might be some bad reason. Uh, then the narratives uh, changed a little bit. So the new, rel uh, new narratives appeared in 2014, and that was the time I lived in Ukraine already. Uh, so I saw how it was uh, developing. Uh, because uh, I moved just a year ago, before, before 2014, uh, and uh, I was a radio host on radio, so I, uh, I was on air every day for four hours. I had an afternoon show. So I talked to people a lot, uh, um, in Russian and in Ukrainian, and so uh, I know what people were thinking, and I also got a lot of feedback uh, that time uh, from uh, my Moscow relatives and co-workers, and that was the time actually when I lost uh, a lot of friends. Uh, so uh, now, uh, when the full-scale war started, uh, a lot, uh, very often people ask me, like, uh, how you probably lost a lot of people, lost a lot of friends or connections, and I said, I, I actually went through that uh, eight, nine years ago already. Uh, because I was in Ukraine, I moved to Ukraine, and some people uh, in Russia, for example, after the annexation of Crimea, uh, uh, knowing that I didn't support it, they uh, they just stopped the relationship with me. Uh, and so, uh, and I'm not unique. A lot of people are like that. Uh, so uh, I was uh, I was seeing how those narratives were changing and, and growing, and at least was growing. Uh, so again, they said the revolution was backed by the Western countries, the activists were bribed, the uh, activists were drugged, uh, that they said that all people on uh, Maidan Square, the central square in, uh, in, in Kiev, and uh, by the way, I lived right in the central square, the building was right next to it, uh, so I, I saw, <laughs> I've seen everything that happened there. And uh, they said that all people, they were like uh, drunk, uh, they were only um, uh, people, like poor people came from different regions, they are, or they, they are drunk there, they are not doing anything without job, homeless, like something like that. Uh, again, trying to push that narrative that a uh, normal person cannot protest. Uh, and um, also, when uh, the invasion of Donbass started, they, they uh, <coughs> added one more narrative, 
Ukrainians are bombing themselves, and they use it uh, till now. So they were, they were saying that they, they did it, not us. Uh, the Ukrainian president is a failure. That's what they uh, said about uh, Pyotr Poroshenko at that time. And on Russian TV, you could see a, a lot of newspapers criticizing, for example, like how he looked, uh, what suit uh, he was wearing. Uh, and I do remember one piece on, I think it was a uh, uh, state Russian TV channel, uh, Russia 24. Uh, they said, uh, I don't remember well, maybe Russia 24 or NTV, they, they said that uh, Petr Poroshenko, uh, during one of his visits uh, in some country, I don't remember where, uh, where exactly, uh, uh, they noticed uh, that a hole in his sock uh, and so they showed it, they zoomed it in, uh, and they dedicated, you know, the whole piece to the to Poroshenko sock. Uh, and that's how they talk about uh, appearance, physical conditions, so the things you, you wouldn't actually uh, talk about, they are not uh, relevant and it's not ethical. Uh, to talk uh, about people like that, but that's uh, all uh, uh, tools they use while talking about other presidents, and not only about pa uh, Poroshenko and now Zelensky. They talk uh, about uh, uh, they talk like that uh, about Biden uh, and about European leaders and uh, about many uh, many other people. Uh, and uh, so Ukrainians are bombing themselves. Ukrainian president is a failure. Uh, Ukraine can't survive without Russia, and here they use and they still uh, they have been using that brotherly nation concept. Uh, it, this concept uh, they uh, borrowed it from the Soviet time, uh, when Stalin was the father of the nations, uh, and uh, the nations were like uh, brothers. Uh, although uh, Russia, you know, was a big brother and uh, other nations were a little bit oppressed by that brother in the languages and cultures and, uh, and so on. Uh, and so they uh, continue to push that narrative, uh, narrative about uh, brotherly love. Uh, they say we are brothers, we are brothers. But what I noticed uh, in the um, last maybe several months, uh, m maybe the last, the last part of that year of the war, uh, they uh, they uh, started to decrease uh, the uh, they started to decrease uh, yes that uh, that concept because uh, uh, it doesn't work and people uh, you can't say um, at the same time uh, that all Ukrainians are Nazis and uh, like you need to hate them and on the other hand uh, you are saying they are our brothers it doesn't add up. Uh, so at some point uh, they created so much hate against uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian people uh, that uh, they probably understood that it doesn't it doesn't work anymore. So now uh, it it's not used as much as it used to be uh, used to be in the past. Uh, but still it still exists. Um, and. Uh, Why we have the tech person here? Maybe you ah, can try okay. one of those videos. Try one of those videos. Uh, yeah, well, uh, um, he can help you with the sound. Yes, but I now I can. I want to go to the next slide, but I can't. So when the full scale war started in 2022, uh, the list of those narratives uh, grew even more. Oh, before I go to that new list, uh, I will tell you, some of you know that already, that in 2014, uh, the year I was just talking about, uh, appeared maybe the main, uh, the most famous uh, propaganda meme uh, Russian propaganda meme uh, called Crucified Boy. Uh, 
uh, and it became uh, a symbol of uh, Russian fake news and uh, propaganda. Because in 2014, uh, after the invasion of Donbass, uh, they um, released on uh, one of the TV channels, it was uh, Channel First, uh, the main state TV channel in Russia, uh, there was a news story, video story, uh, about how the Ukrainian military, they crucified three-year-old boy in front of the people in Slovyansk, uh, in Donetsk Oblast. Uh, and uh, there was uh, some witness, who, a woman who was saying, like crying, uh, saying, I saw with my own eyes uh, how they crucified that little boy wearing only underwear in front of a uh, lot of people in the central square. Of course, it never happened. Uh, and uh, some independent journalists uh, came uh, to that region and they made a research uh, investigation and they found out that uh, that woman uh, was, not, uh, was not a local who uh, really witnessed something. Uh, she was a wife of one of uh, the leaders of the, those military, pro-Russian uh, military groups. Uh, and uh, so she was, uh, I don't know how it happened with a journalist, maybe she just told the story uh, and it was, and that wasn't the journalist <laughs> initiative. Uh, maybe that woman just wanted to push a story like that on, uh, on the Russian TV. Uh, and uh, so it was proved that it, uh, it was a lie, it was, a fa it was fake news. And you can find uh, even a Wikipedia page uh, now called Crucified Boy, uh, where you can find the whole story. It became a symbol uh, of uh, fake uh, news. Uh, and uh, they even ad admitted that, they said that, oh, we, we just didn't uh, control well that correspondent who went uh, to, uh, to cover this, to make this story. Uh, we didn't know, uh, so we, we just didn't do enough like fact check. Uh, and uh, they, uh, but the, the story still, you can find, you can still find it. So they didn't remove it and uh, they didn't uh, apologize like publicly about that. Uh, so not, not, nothing of that happened. Uh, and then the main uh, uh, narratives, if we are talking about the main narratives of Russian propaganda in 2022, uh, we have the same thing. The revolution was backed by the Western countries. And actually now they are talking, at some point, even Putin started to say the word, the word war, because in the beginning, uh, for several months, the word war itself was banned. And uh, you can even go into prison if you say war instead of special operation. Uh, you can get 15 years in prison for that. But at some point, even Putin started using that word, uh, but in a different context, when he is talking about war, he's talking about uh, war uh, between Russia and the whole other world. Uh, he says that it's like international, that like a world war, uh, and the whole world is against Russia. Uh, and uh, Russia is trying to keep, uh, to keep the world sane. Uh, and the, the rest of the world is trying to, fi to fight uh, Russia. So it, now he's representing this war as a war against Russia and NATO and like other, other uh, and country, different Western countries and organizations. Uh, uh, also, again, the, the activists were bribed, drugged and stuff, uh, and uh, Ukrainians are bombing themselves or staging the atrocities. Uh, the Ukrainian president is a failure. Ukraine can survive without Russia. They need Russia. Uh, you, as I said, Russia is fighting with NATO, not with Ukraine. Uh, and NATO wants to pull Russia apart. Uh, that is one of the main narratives now. Uh, to destroy it and to turn Russian children into perverts. Uh, and you know, that is a, a funny and not funny at the same time, but, but they use this narrative all the time. And almost in every speech, Putin talks about that, uh, saying uh, like uh, uh, the Western society uh, is uh, degra degradating and uh, Russian society keeps the uh, tradition, uh, great traditions. And uh, uh, on the West, uh, they have now, they don't have uh, mom and dad anymore. They have parent number one and parent number two. Uh, so, uh, and uh, he talks about that all the time. Uh, so it's something that uh, bugs him. I, uh, I don't know why, it's uh, maybe for the lecture of some psychologist who can analyze why Putin is so attached to this topic. I don't know.
<laughs> but I can only, as a linguist, as a philologist, I can only notice that he uses it a lot and he says um, a lot of uh, things like that. By the way, uh, before the war, several days before the war, he used, uh, he always uses some sexual uh, inappropriate, sexually inappropriate jokes or uh, connotations or referrals. Uh, and uh, it's very, uh, sometimes it's very weird. Uh, bef right before the war started, he said um, he used the phrase uh, of a, um, uh, from from one of the Russian punk group uh, songs, and that punk group song is about necrophilia, and he used the line from that song saying, "Like um, whether you like it or not, uh, you need to like tolerate it," uh, saying about Ukraine whether you like it or not, like I, I will do what I want with you, the meaning is. Uh, and uh, when people heard that, uh, they were like, uh, well, he, he's using that, uh, the line from the song of, about necrophilia. <laughs> so, and, uh, uh, and it's like some abusive uh, connotation, you know, uh, and that shows his real attitude to other countries, uh, to, to countries from the former Soviet Union, uh, that he wants to uh, dominate that he wants to oppress them, uh, abuse them, and do what what he wants to do. Uh, so um, now I want to uh, go to the main tools, uh, Russian. That is very yes. That will be very useful now. Uh, now we are going to the main tools, uh, main tools of Russian propaganda, uh, and this is my favorite part <laughs> as a philologist. One of the uh, one of the main tools, and I think it's probably the base of everything now, euphemization or covering bad things with good names, uh, if we use like the simple language. So they ban the word war and say special operation. They don't say invading; they say liberation, and that's very interesting. Uh, when if you read Russian and Ukrainian media, you can notice using the same words but in absolutely different meanings. Uh, for example, when uh, Russian military take over city, uh, some city or town, they say they liberated that city. Uh, and when Ukraine takes it back, they also say they liberated that city. But the difference is that uh, Ukrainians really liberate because it's their land. Uh, they, they take it back, their town or city. Uh, and uh, Russians uh, use it uh, as a euphemism. And uh, there is the whole dictionary of euphemisms they use for different situations. Uh, for example, uh, if you remember that story uh, and you know that meme about Russian warship, uh, go uh, F yourself, one of the main memes of the war, uh, it was in the beginning of the war uh, when they came to the Snake Island and uh, the Ukrainian military heard that it was a Moscow warship, they, say, uh, they said, Russian warship and you know the ending. Uh, then uh, they got captured, but then, uh, um, and released up after all, but uh, that Russian warship, you know, it sank, and, uh, but, but before that, uh, they, um, uh, they actually stepped back from that island, uh, that island, and when they stepped back from that island, they said it was, they were forced by Ukrainians, uh, they had to, but they said in Russian media, they said, uh, they used the phrase uh, gesture of goodwill. They said we did a gesture of goodwill. Uh, and it's another euphemism uh, to cover what really happened. Uh, and as I said, it's the whole vocabulary. Everything, every little thing has its euphemism uh, now for uh, telling people about what is going on. Uh, liberation or helping brother nations. And uh, so the, these are the main tools, overloading your audience with information, uh, mirroring or reflecting, and hate speech. And I will uh, talk a little bit about each of them. So uh, let me go to, uh, to that um, euphemism part, euphemization part. Uh, every time they bomb civilians, they say uh, that was a high precision strike. And if it was a high precision strike, they wouldn't, uh, civilians wouldn't be dead or wounded, right? Uh, and every time it happens, if you, you can analyze, you can pick 
any event uh, related to bombing civilian objects, like Kramatorsk I mentioned, uh, Mariupol Maternity Hospital, Vinnytsia, uh, and so on. The list is big. And every time they said it was a high precision strike. Uh, so uh, at, uh, we, we, they, they are saying we didn't uh, do any harm to the civilians because it was high precision strike. But uh, with time, when people understood that it doesn't uh, add up, and actually they use it every time when civilians die, uh, it became like a synonym of aggression. So when, uh, when you say high precision strike, it immediately uh, has this association with aggression and with civilians uh, dying. That was another euphemism they use a lot. Uh, and there was a funny name uh, of, uh, funny meme about Bavovna. I don't know, have, uh, I, I know that one person for sure knows about that <laughs> in this audience. <laughs> uh, who, who knows about Bavovna? Uh, so Bavovna in Ukrainian is cotton, material, cotton. Uh, in Russian, it's the different word, chlopok, uh, chlopok. Uh, and uh, in Russian, we have two words that spells uh, the same, they have the same spelling, but they have different pronunciation. We have chlopok as a, um, uh, as a material, and we have chlopok as a sound, as a cl clap. So the difference is in a st a stressed syllable. Uh, and on internet, uh, some of the, the Russian trolls, bots, they were trying to pretend Ukrainians and they were trying to write something in Ukrainian. But obviously they used Google Translate and Google Translate doesn't see the stresses on the syllables. So the Google Translate translated uh, Hlopok as Hlopak, Bavovna. And now I will explain what it means. So, so that's how people knew it was, uh, it was not a Ukrainian person writing because the, the absolutely different word. What does it mean, chlopok, in uh, Russian newspeak, propaganda language? It's another euphemism. Each time there is some explosion in Russia, on Russia's territory, they use the word chlopok. They don't say explosion. They say chlopok or um, uh, loud sound. Uh, because they don't want to tell people the truth and to show that really like some explosion happened. So they use Hlopok and Belgorod uh, on the border with uh, Ukraine. You know? And uh, so they, they use a lot of uh, things like that. And Hlopok is one of the main euphemisms uh, in that uh, dictionary of vocabulary of uh, war. Uh, that's why uh, they were discussing some Hlopok, some Hlopki uh, explosions on the Russian territory. Uh, and translating it, uh, while translating it, they got this Ukrainian word, and it became a meme. And now you can even find it online in Urban Dictionary, as you can see, uh, and read about it. And uh, in Ukrainian media, they use it a lot, uh, like ironically. They say, another Bavovna happened, another explosion. It means some explosion on Russian uh, territory. Uh, and uh, I usually, um, uh, when I talk about it, I have a, uh, I forgot to bring this t-shirt. I have a t-shirt with a chlopak, with a flower, cotton flower, uh, because it became very popular. People buy it, and now they say that the best flower uh, for the Ukrainian girl is a cotton flower. <laughs> uh, so that, that became one of, uh, one of the memes of the war. So that was euphemization part, creating the whole new language. Uh, like uh, in Orwell, in Newspeak, they created war, uh, war as a peace, uh, and, and uh, peace as a war, and uh, so on. Uh, another uh, tool is lowering, uh, lowering uh, this is another meme, you can read that line. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is based on euphemization, by the way. This is what, what it says. So uh, another tool they use uh, is uh, loading people with information. What does it mean? Uh, here is the guy from uh, the Ministry of Defense, Russian Ministry of Defense. And each day he, has his, uh, his, uh, he gives his report about what is going on. And his speech is very, very monotone, like he speaks fast, monotone, uh, and he gives a lot of numbers and names. So we took this and that village and we destroyed uh, uh, so many tanks and uh, we have Ukrainian weapons. And a normal person, when you hear him, 
A normal person uh, cannot remember all this information. You cannot remember uh, dozens of names and uh, how many things and uh, combine them together and make some research at the same time. So you can't um, check, check him. You're just sitting in front of TV and he's loading you with, it, uh, with the information. But what happened? Uh, the independent Russian media, uh, Russian speaking uh, media, uh, they, they are not based in Russia anymore for the obvious reasons. Uh, they called Project, uh, and uh, I highly recommend them. They have very high quality um, investigations. Um, uh, it's called Project, uh, like Project in uh, in um, uh, in English Project and in Russian Project. Uh, project Media, and uh, they have English versions of their articles as well. Uh, so they uh, did some research. They listened to all the speeches of that Igor Konashenkov, the representative of the Russian Ministry of Defense. They wrote down all the numbers and names, uh, and they did some um, analytics based on that, and they found out that, first of all, uh, he named the cities uh, or villages that um, not even exist <laughs> in Ukraine or the whole regions, like new names. Uh, secondly, uh, he was claiming that uh, Russia destroyed uh, that many weapons that Ukraine didn't have, so more than they had. Uh, and the third uh, conclusion was uh, that uh, they captured the same uh, the same towns or villages several times. It, it means we can't even know if, whether they captured them or not, uh, because, for example, uh, he reported about uh, capturing Kremlina uh, in Donbas for four times. Uh, but since we never know about Russia stepping back from that Kremlina, we don't even know what. Uh, so what was going on? Maybe they never captured it, or maybe they, uh, they captured it once and then he was just repeating it uh, to show the, uh, the success of Russian army. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a very, very simple tool, but it works. Because again, as I said, a normal person uh, can't physically remember that information, but at the same time, they have an impression that something significant happened. So you are, uh, you are listening to that uh, load of information and you're like, oh, Russian military, they're like having some su success now. But you can't analyze it at the same time. You just have this impression of something significant is going on uh, and it based on the uh, on that fact that people can't, can't check it. Uh, you need to do a special research to check it. Uh, so uh, I put this question, uh, what is the, this about? Because uh, if you read those lines without knowing who said them, you might think that uh, it's maybe uh, maybe some international organizations, representatives, uh, they were talking about Ukraine, about uh, people are killed, tortured, thrown into prison. Maybe something said it about Russia uh, because it looks like, uh, like something in Russia, bombing hospitals and schools. Maybe someone was talking about, but no, uh, these are all quotes from uh, Putin's speeches, and uh, he was talking about Ukraine. And uh, we can see here the third uh, tool I was going to talk about called uh, mirroring or reflecting. Uh, so he uses the same, absolutely same words and lines and phrases they use against him. Uh, when they say, uh, when uh, international uh, leaders and the organization said that Russia is bombing uh, civilians. Putin said that Ukrainians are bombing civilians. That in Ukraine there is no freedom of speech. They throw people into prison. They uh, ban some media or some political parties. And uh, so he uses absolutely the same language. Sometimes it's uh, the, sa the same words. It, lo it looks like a quote, but ju he's just reflecting it. Uh, and um, it was very well... Um, said, I, I would say, when he met uh, Biden uh, before the war, uh, they had several months before the war, they had, uh, uh, they had this conversation and uh, Putin said, ah, no, 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 it was, uh, I, I'm sorry, I mixed it up. So you remember that um, situation when some journalists asked Joe Biden, do you think 
Putin is a murderer, and Biden said, mm hmm. Uh, and so a lot of people, uh, a lot of media quoted that. Uh, and uh, when Putin knew about that, he said, um, he said a very popular child's, uh, child or kid's expression, Кто так обзывается, тот сам так называется. It's difficult to translate, but I forgot the English equivalent. That sticks on you. I'm a glue that sticks on you. What is the whole expression? I forgot. Whatever you say. Whatever you say, yes, sticks on you. So that is that was the Russian equivalent. So he used that child saying. Uh, um, saying about uh, Biden, and actually that's the instrument he uses, the tool that sticks on you. So whatever people say about him, that sticks on other people. He put those labels on other people, the same thing. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, last tool, fourth, uh, number four, is just very simple hate speech. Uh, and uh, as I said, the level of hate speech in Russia is unbelievable. Uh, I wrote an article, one of the articles for, uh, the, for Voice of America. I compare the narratives in uh, Rwanda during genocide in Rwanda and uh, what kind of narratives they use now in Russia. And it's, uh, it's scary how it's similar, how they're similar. Uh, because they use the same, uh, the same tools and it, sometimes the, almost the same words. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's very hard to, to realize to what extent the hate speech uh, the hate speech on Russian TV uh, uh, now is uh, like blooming uh, it's uh, in every uh, almost in every program and they uh, let themselves say uh, things they didn't let themselves uh, say before before the war uh, so uh, you've heard about uh, killing that uh, very popular patriotic uh, military blogger in Russia. Uh, he was giving a lecture in St. Petersburg and some woman came to that lecture. She gave him a, um, like a statue, like a figure, figure statue. And there was a bomb inside and so he was killed and some people there were wounded. And he was uh, one of the most popular uh, military bloggers uh, who, uh, whose uh, posts were like real fuel to that uh, hate, hatred and uh, to hate against, uh, against Ukrainian and Ukraine. Uh, I, I wanted to show you one short video, if you can help me, uh, where he can, he is saying this, like we will kill everyone, we will rob everyone. So he used uh, like real hate speech in his posts and uh, I, after that happened, I watched his Telegram channel a little bit, his videos, uh, because of course I was not <laughs> a follower of that blogger, so <laughs> I just knew about him. So I decided to watch some of his videos and uh, he said words like, this country should not exist, uh, like very straight but without any, you know, uh, this country uh, should not exist, uh, we need to, uh, they are not, uh, there is not only a like, group of Nazis, they are all like that, we need to uh, annihilate them. So he used language like that uh, in his videos. Unfortunately, it, ah, it, it okay. gets blocked. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Sounds like the counter information. Because it's, maybe because it's related to the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, and uh, the, uh, one of the most famous quotes of him was, we will kill everyone, we will rob everyone uh, who needs to be robbed. And he said that phrase in Kremlin, after the ceremony, uh, there was a ceremony when they annexed uh, the four regions, uh, new regions of uh, Ukraine, uh, there was a ceremony in Kremlin. And after going, uh, after that ceremony, he was filming himself, like doing video selfie, uh, and he was smiling and saying, we will kill everyone, <laughs> we will rob everyone. Uh, and uh, so can you imagine in Kremlin, uh, like after the, some uh, government event uh, and he, where he was invited to, and he's saying that, saying he wants to kill people. Uh, and uh, on, if we can't see it, it's, it's okay. Yeah, no, I can, no, it, yeah. it froze everything. Ah, it now it's okay. So maybe I should 
we have to okay. st restart it again. Okay, so talking about uh, the hate speech, it's actually almost the end of uh, my uh, presentation. There was another um, a, a journalist, a TV host, Anton Krasovsky, uh, who worked for RT, Russia Today, uh, and who said in one of his interviews uh, with the famous uh, Russian writer who also supports Putin and the so-called special operation, uh, and Anton Krasovsky said in this interview that Ukrainian kids should be uh, burned in their houses and uh, drowned and stuff like that. After that, uh, he apologized and he said, oh, I was uh, too emotional uh, and something like that. But uh, the quote was already uh, everywhere. Uh, and also uh, one of the main propagandists um, of the regime, Vladimir Solovyov, um, who is a host, a TV host uh, of one of the most popular uh, weekend TV shows. Uh, he said once, or he's, he says something like that all the time, but one of the most uh, mm, interesting and shocking examples for me uh, was when he said that he compared that special operation uh, with deworming a cat. Uh, he said, when you deworming, when you take worms out of cat's body, uh, for worms, for the worms, it's a war. But for the cat, it's liberation. Uh, so here we see the total dehumanization of people because he basically uh, compared them to, to worms. Well, that's exactly what uh, they did in Rwanda uh, when they compared people to cockroaches and, you know. Uh, so the hate speech is... Uh, uh, blooming on uh, Russian TV now, unfortunately, and even the intonations, uh, the tone of the, the discussion, it has changed a lot um, during the last several years, not only after the war started, but maybe, uh, uh, maybe even earlier. Uh, people just yell at each other. They can't talk calmly. If you watch uh, the Russian TV show, uh, they, they yell, they call uh, each other names, uh, sometimes they would fight, and it's embarrassing to, to watch this, but what it um, uh, does to people who are watching uh, this kind of content almost every day, uh, people start talking like that. And I noticed it by uh, communicating uh, to uh, some people in Russia, because they speak with the same intonations, the same tone, they yell, uh, and it's actually, it's very sad, uh, so how, how it works. Mm, uh, that's probably uh, all I wanted to say. Let me check here. I'm, uh, I'm sorry about the uh, technical uh, issues. Yes. Ah, I, wa I forgot, and I had very funny picture for you to show. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, by the way, that Solovyov, uh, one of the main propagandists, uh, by one of his uh, cases, we can see how uh, how the hate speech and how uh, how propaganda can really work and kill people. Because in September, when they announced uh, the mobilization, uh, one of the narratives of uh, uh, of the state TV was criticizing that mobilization. Uh, it uh, might feel uh, it, uh, you might think that it doesn't add up, but it does because they wanted to show that. Uh, they are fighting for like civil rights of people. Uh, they are propagandists. Uh, they are good people, and they don't want to people uh, be taken to war uh, without any reason, like without uh, against the law. Everything should be according to the law, and uh, we will watch it. And Margarita Simonyan, the head of Russia today, was pushing that uh, narrative, and uh, Vladimir Solovyov. And Vladimir Solovyov, he is so-called uh, turbo patriot. Uh, so, uh, patriot too much, patriotic too much. Uh, and uh, he said in one of his shows, he said that, uh, like, I would just shot those military, um, military um, recruiters, commissioners, uh, who are doing something against the law and who recruit people against the law. And you know what happened the next day in Irkutsk? Uh, a guy went to, uh, uh, he'd really shoot a military recruiter. So he, uh, so he gave that signal to people that uh, aggression and violence uh, are allowed. Uh, and uh, why uh, I was talking about the funny picture, because I wanted to tell you, uh, tell a couple of words uh, about um, uh, one of the main people in Russian politics who are associated with the hate speech. 
uh, it's Mr. Medvedev, a former president uh, who runs his uh, very uh, uh, popular <laughs> Telegram channel. Uh, and uh, he is known, yes, uh, he, he uses, he uses uh, the language you can't even, uh, like, uh, I, I can't wrap my mind around that because of where, where does he take all those words. Uh, he, use, uh, he uses a lot of a very, very offensive, offensive language against different political uh, leaders, uh, different countries. So the words, you can, they just no, no words. You, can, you cannot use uh, word vocabulary like that. And he uses all of them. Uh, uh, against uh, Americans uh, and uh, Europeans, uh, uh, French people, German people, e everybody, everybody. Uh, and this is the picture I wanted to show you. The <laughs> Medvedev who was between Putin and Putin. Uh, so, yes, I think we should uh, wrap it up. I just wanted to. Uh, Yes, these are some seven most common tricks of the uh, trade use, used by successful propagandists uh, and uh, named by the Institute of Propaganda Analysis. Uh, and uh, we can find all of them in uh, Russian media now. They use all of them. Uh, here's another book. I'm uh, actually going to the uh, heading to the end of the presentation, but I wanted to advise you to read this book as well if you find it in English. I know for sure about Dmitry Glukovsky, but I'm not sure about this book. I just have read uh, in my Ukrainian book club, <laughs> and this is a book uh, of a Ukrainian writer, Yaroslav Melnik. Uh, this is a dystopia, uh, and uh, I found very, very interesting how he described the role of the language uh, in this book. So in this uh, book, uh, the fascism uh, won. Uh, in, uh, so the city is uh, like somewhere on the planet and the Reich uh, um, succeeded and uh, the fascists came to the power, but they are like so-called post-fascists, they humanists. And they divided people into two different, uh, not races, like types. Uh, one type is, of course, like a higher, uh, higher type, and uh, the other one uh, is the lower type. And they put uh, those people from the second group in the barns, without clothes, without, like uh, animals. And they made them live there like animals, and within uh, several decades and centuries and uh, even more, those people really turned into animals. Because if you live like this, like that and you have kids and those kids have kids, and so after several generations, you, d you really like turn into animal. But why did they do that? And that's what I found very interesting, this idea of the book. They did it to call those people, like former people, they called them uh, human-like creatures. And they started killing them and used them as uh, like eating their meat and uh, so like uh, like cows and, or uh, pigs. Uh, and they say there is no problem. We are not killing people because we are killing human-like uh, creatures. Uh, so they, it's, it's the question of language. How you uh, how you call your enemy or someone you don't uh, like and. Uh, it gives you a pass to do whatever you want uh, to, to, to that person uh, or to that group of people. So we, we are not, they're not real people. They're just human-like uh, creatures, well, animals. And uh, very often it happens uh, when uh, propaganda calls uh, different groups of people, uh, put labels uh, on them in different uh, countries and in different areas. So that's what I wanted to, to say. And uh, at the end, uh, I wanted to uh, like answer a question why is uh, the propaganda is so successful? Because as I said before, uh, it didn't happen uh, it didn't happen like in one day. It was uh, the situation was well prepared for that. Uh, they, they were gradually shutting down the independent media and uh, 
uh, in the past year at least 500, more than 500 Russian journalists from 27 media have moved abroad. Uh, so there is no, no independent media in Russia now uh, at all because it's just, uh, it's impossible to be independent according to the new laws they implemented after the war started. Uh, according to that law, you can use only the language they use. You cannot use the different language. Uh, and if you do, uh, you, uh, the criminal case can be opened against you, which happened with a lot of people and they had to escape. Or some of them are unfortunately in prison or, fine, or had huge fines or something like that. Uh, so that is, uh, maybe that's why uh, it's uh, so successful because it's uh, very well done uh, and uh, they put a lot of effort in it uh, for many years uh, and people are surrounded by that uh, propaganda. There is no, they have no, no choice of what to read, what to watch it's, and the, this choice is uh, getting uh, smaller and smaller and I, I asked you to bring me a newspaper to show something. So uh, the situation with um, the independent media in Russia, I like to compare it with uh, some uh, high school contest uh, we had uh, when I lived in Russia and uh, went to high school. <laughs> that contest was for the parties, we used it for the parties, dancing on a newspaper. Have you ever heard about that? Uh, so when uh, you put a newspaper like that and you have several couples and they, they dance on the whole newspaper, uh, then you fold it like that uh, and you dance on a half of a paper. Then you fold it like that and you dance on a quarter. Then you fold it like that and you have a couple. And you have to dance on this and try not to, not to fall down. And the winner is who is still uh, staying on the newspaper. So that what was happening with Russian media. We were trying to dance on the newspaper, but at some point there is no newspaper at all. So uh, you need to leave country and be a normal journalist outside the country, or you have to, if you have to stay for some reasons, uh, you have to obey those rules and you cannot be a journalist uh, anymore. You just can't keep uh, journalist, journalistic standards. Uh, so that's what I wanted to um, maybe to to wrap it up with. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, I just uh, a little disclaimer: I'm not a political analyst, so I would love to answer any questions related to language and to situation with media. But I cannot analyze uh, like geopolitics and something like that. That wouldn't be correct. I don't know, to be honest, I don't know the statistics, so it's, it's hard to say. But about the situation in Belgorod, they, by the way, they used a very specific uh, phrase talking about that. I cannot translate it into English. Maybe you can help me. It was, uh, uh, they said, uh, happened. it's a very, it's absurd. Uh, it's totally absurd. I cannot even translate it. An unexpected drop of ammunition? Uh, something like that, but it's a very specific, like that official, official lang language. Yes, and I'm yes. unexpected. Nishtatni. Yes. Uncounted for? Maybe. So they uh, they didn't say hlapok about that. They said <laughs> unexpected drop of ammunition. <laughs> Well, I, I was thinking, you know, is there hope in Russia in, in any way? For media? 
for media, yeah. for you know. But again, if you don't have as as member of mm -hmm. a population, if you don't have any other view than the official mm -hmm. view, and if you try to to mm -hmm. look outside of the country, and then you are hit or uh, threatened mm -hmm. with uh, with the prison, mm -hmm. uh, what is the future for the person without the media? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I wanted to tell you that I don't want you to think that all people in Russia are supporting the war because there is a pretty significant part of the society who are against the war, uh, but they are very uh, scared and depressed and they just can't express themselves. Uh, but uh, some of them are still trying to do something and now we don't have, uh, in Russia, the, there is no mass protest at all, uh, as you see, uh, but uh, there are some individual, very small individual protests, uh, peaceful protests, like people would uh, we would bring flowers to the monument of uh, Taras Shevchenko, the, mo uh, the most uh, famous uh, Ukrainian writer and poet in Moscow. Uh, and it's already a lot for Moscow because they, they in Moscow they arrest they can arrest people even for a blank paper and that happened several times. Like people were standing somewhere on the square with a blank paper. It's a referral to the very popular Soviet anecdote. Uh, like a person was arrested for a blank paper and uh, uh, when he asked why, uh, they said, well, uh, we understand everything. Uh, and uh, so uh, they arrested a couple of people for blank paper and for just saying uh, we want peace or something like that, very peaceful statements. Uh, so uh, there is a protest like that to show something small, some small empathy like g gesture of empathy to Ukraine, it's already a, a lot, unfortunately, in this situation. And I just talked uh, before uh, traveling here, I talked to one of the uh, Russian opposition politicians who is still st staying in Russia. You know that uh, Russian, uh, one of the Russian oppositioners, Vladimir Karamurza, was sentenced to 25 years uh, in prison. And after that, I talked to her. Her name is Yulia Galyamina. Uh, she is pretty well known uh, opposition uh, politician in Russia and her choice is to stay there. And uh, mm, mm, you know, a lot of people, they don't understand why people still want to stay there because it's obvious they, they want to put everybody in prison as they did with Navalny and with Ilya Yashin, uh, who was a, a, another opposition leader, a friend of Boris Nemtsov. Uh, and uh, uh, now Vladimir Karamurza, uh, 25 years, uh, and uh, she said, um, sh so she gave me two reasons. Uh, one reason I don't quite uh, understand and I don't uh, share the same, uh, the same views as her, she said that I still believe that I can do something. Uh, there are like uh, small uh, elections and the little uh, district elections or something like that where you can uh, win and you can change something and uh, you can make some small changes, like the uh, theory of small steps, so-called. Uh, in my opinion, it's an illusion, but uh, some people believe in that, and they are trying to change the situation. But another reason I think is very uh, valid, uh, because she told me uh, that I want to stay here for people, because there are people who trust me, and uh, I have some responsibility. And if I say, oh, my safety is above all, I don't care about you anymore, I will leave uh, to another country. So uh, for her, this is some kind of betrayal and she doesn't want to do that. And she said that it's important now for people who are against war to feel that there are other people like them. Uh, and uh, I, I would agree with her uh, about that because uh, I know my mom is still there and it's very hard for her to still there with, with her views uh, because she feels, uh, she has this feeling of being surrounded by aggressive people who are you know, like pro-war uh, and she uh, appreciates a lot each time uh, she meets someone uh, someone who shares her, her views and beliefs. So this reason um, I, I can understand and uh, I, maybe it's really important. So that's what she told me. There are still uh, people who are trying to make some changes and who are waiting for, uh, the, um, for regime to fall and for situation to change and uh, 
uh, they believe they, they they think there is a hope but it's uh, it's very difficult to to say if there is a hope because now the situation is very very uh, difficult it was not like that uh, it's maybe first time it's it's like that uh, and that's why people compare it to uh, Stalin era uh, because even the sentences the prison sentences are like in Stalin era so uh, from that lower point how Russia can uh, get uh, to like normal life again it's I think it would be very very difficult so what does really happen with the families of the people, of journalists who leave the country? Do they target their families? Yes, some of, yes, some of their families, and they have friends, uh, colleagues whose families were targeted. Uh, so they would uh, come to their houses and make some searches and uh, trying to, to, to scare people and, you know, um, by the way, I mentioned that project media who uh, the, that team who are making investigations, uh, they um, relocated, they moved to uh, the, the two main journalists of that team, they moved to the United States, by the way, and one is in Washington, D.C., another one is in California, the founder of that project, uh, with, with the families, because the families were threatened. Um, so uh, usually they try to move with the families, and uh, if the relatives are still there, it's hard for them to work, uh, because because of the relatives staying there. I, I am talking about journalists um, who, uh, who moved out uh, in the last year after those new laws, uh, because it's not that dangerous for me, for example, I moved many years ago, uh, and uh, I'm personally, as a person, I'm not labeled as a foreign agent. Uh, but a lot of people who moved out, uh, Voice of America is labeled as a foreign agent, the whole organization. But uh, the people, uh, sometimes they label a person. Uh, and uh, those people I was talking about, they labeled personally as a foreign agent. So it's uh, different for them and uh, also they are breaking the laws that were just uh, implemented. You know, I'm, I'm originally from Romania, very close to Russia. I know what this you know, this means to, to the people. But I think we have time just for one question. I saw your hand up. And then we will have to make some time for the next speaker, which is uh, scheduled uh, at two. Yes, now, I said now we've got three quicker one is pro-war, anti-war, and maybe neutral as well. So I was just wondering, what would be the best narrative to persuade that anti um, pro-war to be your group, or at least to be neutral? This is a very good question, and uh, uh, there are those groups, as, uh, as you noticed, the pro-war, anti-war, and the neutral group. And that neutral, neutral group is the biggest one. Uh, and actually, it's the most dangerous group, because uh, they, they just don't care. They, uh, they are saying uh, that, that kind of people who say, like, we, are, uh, we want to be like, far from politics. We are far, uh, there are even jokes about that. There is an anecdote. Uh, like um, two people in the police uh, van are going somewhere and one is asking which concentration camp are we going to and the, and the other one is replying I don't know I'm out of I'm trying to be out of politics <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so they even have jokes about that kind of people uh, because actually pro-war people in my opinion it's, very, it's easier to turn them uh, into anti-war because when they see the because they are pro-war aggressively pro-war they want some results and when they see that there is no results war is going and going people are dying and they're sending people to war it's easy to turn them against uh, the government then to that then that neutral group that is like we we don't care we just want to uh, post our uh, cats and recipes on Facebook. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it, yes, uh, there are a lot of people like that. And I talked uh, twice uh, in the beginning of the war, I mean several months after the war started, and recently uh, to a researcher from, by the way, I think she's from here. She based, she based, she's based here. Uh, Natalia Salaviola? Huh? St. Louis or the United States? No, in Missouri. I think she, she's based in Missouri. I, I might be, uh, I might be, let me, I need to, I need, I need to check, I need to check. Uh, so she is sociologist and she made, with her colleagues in Moscow, they made a research, in, in Russia, they made a research 
uh, they did like a huge poll. Uh, they asked people uh, in Russia, uh, people from all those three groups, and they figured out that that group was the biggest one. And after a year of the war, they made the same research, the same poll as well. Uh, uh, and uh, they figured out, they, were, they had a hope that the neutral group will decrease, so people would turn into like anti-war people. But they say it stayed the same, it stayed the same after the year. Well, I would like to listen to you for the next two days. <laughs> if, you, if you have the oh, time. I'm sorry, I took if a lot of time. If you have the time. I know that when the subject is rich, you never want to end because it's, it, you, it seems like you need to share. Mm -hmm. it, it happens to me many times when I talk about that part of the world. But thank you very much for, for your uh, Okay. Um, again, uh, let me draw very quickly uh, while we prepare for the next speaker. Let me draw.